All right, turn your Bibles, if you would, to Acts chapter 18 this morning. Uh, Last week I told you that we were going to have a guest speaker here. We were going to kick off Missions Month. And uh, his father, I think somewhat unexpectedly, passed away last week. And the funeral was on Wednesday, and we decided just to punt things for a while. So we're going to reschedule him, and then we'll do our Missions Month at that time as well. So you get me this morning. Acts chapter 18. You know, the book of Acts, as we've gone through it, has followed a particular rhythm that you see over and over again. Somebody goes in, they proclaim proclaim the gospel. You see fruit from that. People end up coming to Christ uh, after the proclamation of the gospel. And then what do you see after that? You see pushback. You see blowback you see persecution. This is over and over and over. And really, in Acts, you see some of the ups and downs of serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Ups and downs that every believer is going to face at some point. I wish I could tell you that in the middle of those ups and downs that we're all constantly full of faith. And they're all constantly full of joy. And when we meet each one of those ups and downs, particularly the downs, that we meet those without any discouragement. But you know the truth. You often battle discouragement. I often battle discouragement as we serve the Lord. And you're not alone in that. This particular passage right here, I think is going to help us. It's going to pull the curtain back on the Apostle Paul and show that yes, while he is an apostle, and there are very, very few of those, only in the early church, and that God did gift them in particular ways that Paul is a servant of the Lord just like you. He's a servant of the Lord just like me. Paul faced discouragement. And what we're going to see is that when he faced discouragement, that the Lord was there to encourage him when he needed it. Let's look at it here in Acts 18. We're going to pick up in verse 1 and read through verse 17. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed him and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. The Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking. And do not be silent, for I am with you. And no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. But when Galio the proconsul of Achaia, the Jews, uh, uh, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal. This is when Galileo was the proconsul. Saying, this man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Galileo said to the Jews, if this were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I would have a reason to accept your complaint. But since it is a matter of questions about words and names and your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. And he drove them from the tribunal. And they all seized Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Galileo paid no attention to any of this. You know, if you were to summarize this here, or uh, kind of the heart of this passage when you walk away from it, it was this, or it would be this. Trust God to give you well-timed encouragement. Trust God to give you well-timed encouragement. There's a lot of good ministry that's going on here in Corinth, and, and that's something that we'll talk about at another point, and when we eventually go through the book of 1 Corinthians, we'll see that. But we see Paul here, 
in a moment of weakness, self-confessed weakness, we'll see. And we see God coming to him at the perfect time. I want to pray today that the Lord would encourage you through his word. I don't know, I don't know the situations that you are facing as you've come into here. Some of you might be in deep discouragement. Some of you might be in a time of encouragement and joy in walking with the Lord. If that's the case, there's going to be a time of discouragement that's going to come. So take notes because this might help you as you get there. But I'm going to ask the Lord to minister or to serve His Word to us today so that we can all walk away out of here with our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ and encouraged and built up by what we hear. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I pray that you would help me proclaim the Word here. Lord, protect me from myself. Protect me from my ideas and my flesh. I pray that you would fill me with your spirit, that Jesus would be glorified, and that on the backside of this, that our eyes would be lifted up to him and we would once again see what a wonderful Savior he is. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Context is very, very important to this passage. We'll see why in just a moment. If you remember, Paul is on what we would consider his second missionary journey. There's a lot that's gone on before this. This is a map of the ancient world. You know, Paul had started off in this area here. He had done a missionary journey up here. And Paul had actually got to that point being a persecutor of the church. You can go all the way back to the beginning of Acts. You see a large number of people come to faith in Jerusalem. They put their faith in Jesus Christ as the Messiah of Israel. And this persecution comes. And that church grows and more persecution comes. And it ends up pushing those people out. And as those people are pushed out, the Apostle Paul comes to faith in Christ. The one who persecuted the church, the one who killed Christians, is now a professor of Christ himself. So he goes on what we could call his first missionary journey over in this area, Asia Minor. He comes back to Antioch there in Syria. So after that, he goes on what we call his second missionary journey. This one's probably three or more years long. And he ends up providentially and sovereignly, not back over here visiting these churches like he wanted to, he ends up over here in Greece. You remember he landed first in Philippi, and then he went to this town called Thessalonica, then he went to this town called Berea, and then last week we saw him in Athens. Think of what happened in each one of those towns. Just this missionary journey. In Philippi he was thrown in prison and he was beaten. He went to Thessalonica and he was accused by rabble-rousers of being a rabble-rouser. He was accused of turning the world upside down and he fled uh, wanting to save his life. Or or God had him flee to save his life because they wanted to kill him. So he goes to Berea and he finds some people who are open to the word in Berea. But here comes this, this crowd of people from Thessalonica who are, guess what, trying to kill him there in Berea. So then he goes to Athens, and that's what we saw last week. Athens is a city that's given holy to idolatry. And while he's in Athens, he, he receives a very cool reception. He's able to go in front of the Areopagus, this uh, group of men who decided religious and political matters, and he gives this testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ, but he's cut off, and he only sees one or two people come to Christ out of that. So he leaves Athens. Now, here's the interesting thing about him leaving Athens. In chapter 17, we're told that he went to Athens to wait on Silas and Timothy. So after this happens before the Areopagus, Paul leaves town before Silas and Timothy get there. We're going to read between the lines a little bit here. We're going to look at 1 Corinthians in just a moment to explain this. But you get the idea that Paul left early because... We see Silas and Timothy having to track him down and end up finding him in Corinth. So he leaves Athens and he goes to Corinth. And let me tell you, Corinth was a doozy. 750,000 people in this city. Remember, Athens only had 10,000. 750,000 people in this city. They had an established synagogue. This was the big commercial center of the Roman Empire. John Stott said that if Athens was the intellectual hub and might be comparable to Boston in our country, that Corinth would have been like New York City. That Ephesus would have been the pop culture city uh, uh, area of of the Roman Empire. It would be like Los Angeles. And Rome would be the political capital. It would be like Washington, D.C. This is kind of what these different cities are in the old Roman Empire there. So he ends up in Corinth. 
But it's not just massively populated, it's also massively wicked. In Corinth, they had a temple carved in a a hillside to the goddess Aphrodite. Aphrodite was the god of love and, and sex. There are a thousand slave priestesses who go around the city looking for worshipers to come to that temple. Simply put, frequenting prostitutes was part of worship in that city. And you had a thousand different women around the city trying to get you to engage in that. It is a place of incredible darkness. So imagine Paul being here. Paul coming from Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, and Athens having been chased all over Greece and then coming to Corinth, this massive cesspool of paganism. What would your outlook be? I I would like to think that Paul would come in there and say, all right, here's another opportunity to go and proclaim the gospel and here we go, Uh, The Lord is going to be with me and we're going to see massive change here in this city. Well, that was not his outlook. As a matter of fact, and I don't mean this in a very negative way, we figure out that Paul was not in a good place. I love Acts 18 because it's so real for every servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. When Paul is at Corinth, we see several things. We see, first of all, that obedient servants face discouragement. You can see that in verse 9. The Lord's going to come to him. Don't be afraid. Don't be intimidated. Go on speaking. But if you want to turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we get a little bit of insight into what Paul was thinking when he came to Corinth. Okay, so Paul is going to end up being in Corinth for several years. He's going to leave Corinth. He's going to go to another city. He's going to go to Ephesus. And when he's in Ephesus, he's going to hear some problems that are going on in Corinth, and he's going to write a letter to them. And in chapter 2, Paul actually tells us how he felt when he came to Corinth. Chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians. I came to you, I didn't proclaim to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. I, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And listen to what he says in verse 3. I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. When you think about what's happened, and you think about where Paul is going, and then you read this, and then you read what happens in verse 9, you get the idea that Paul might be shook a little. Paul fought weakness. This is what he says in 1 Corinthians 2. I was there... In weakness. Now we know later on in 2 Corinthians that Paul is going to talk about weakness and boasting in this weakness. But you get the idea here that this weakness isn't just, hey Lord, I'm confessing my need of you. This is, I can't do this. I'm not able to do this. Paul fought fear. I was with you in much fear, he said. Would it be reasonable for him to be in fear? I mean, you know, it, it's easy for us to sit, it's easy for us to sit here 2000 years later and keep a stiff upper lip. Paul the man had been stoned, he'd been beaten, he'd been thrown in prison. I don't mean this in any trivial way. If anybody's going to suffer what we would know as what we would know as something that would be legitimate PTSD, he would have it. He fought fear. He didn't just fight fear. He fought intimidation. He fought being intimidated. In verse 9, if you go back to Acts 18, uh, here he is, and we're going to look a little more at this, but he's going to go into the synagogue and he's going to be rejected and he's going to shake his garment out and he's going to tell them, I'm I'm done with you here in this city. I want to go to the Gentiles and then you're going to see one of the leaders of the synagogue saved. And so Paul in verse 9, he's sitting here and he's thinking, whoa, wait a minute. One of the leaders of the synagogue just got saved. I just kind of, you know, shook my garment out at them. It's about to get real here. And he is actually, I believe, considering holding back and not going hard for the gospel. And, and in verse 9, the Lord is going to tell him, don't be solid. There was a temptation for him to shut up. So we can summarize all this by saying that Paul fought discouragement. 
What does it mean to be discouraged? It means to be deprived of courage or confidence. Can you relate? Have you ever been there? Are you there now? Listen, if you live a life that is devoted to following and obeying the Lord Jesus Christ, you will face this too. This is not just for the apostle. It's not just for the pastor. It is for every believer who is a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. You will face this. You know, life is hard for the person who's not serving the Lord. It is. I mean, life on this earth is hard, but it won't be easier if you serve Him. You're going to face blowback. You're going to face wanting to quit. This is why Paul says in Galatians 6, hey, don't give up. In in due season, you will reap if you don't faint. You'll be tired of being different. You might be in poverty. 2 Corinthians 8. People of Macedonia were in great poverty. You might suffer rejection, loss of friends. Paul is going to say later on, everyone has forsaken me, except for one person. At different times, you might face these things, and sometimes you'll have this perfect storm where you face all these things at once. And so when that happens, are we bound for a life of misery? Are we bound for a life of woe? The answer is no. Why not? Well, the answer to that is the Lord encourages the discouraged. Now, there, there are several things that happen in this passage that as I, began, as I began to study, and I'm like, look at the goodness of God here. 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 Look at what God is doing for Paul. As we see this unfold, we see the graciousness of God. This, is, this right here is a pattern for how the Lord encourages us when we're discouraged. All right? First of all, He sends good friends. In verses 1 through 4 here in chapter 18, we meet a couple named Aquila and Priscilla. They are going to become two of the most important people in Paul's life. He found this Jewish man named Aquila. He found his wife Priscilla. They had been commanded to leave Rome. And he worked with them. They, they had recently come from Rome because the emperor there had driven the Jews out. And we don't know exactly what that was. There is a Roman historian who says at this time that Claudius made all the Jews leave, leave Rome because they were fighting over a particular man named Crestus. The Jews were fighting over a particular man named Crestus. It could have been some random nobody. It's also possible, some people think, that that could be a Latinized form of Christ. That there was already some d- d- dispute going on in Rome over Christ, and, and Claudius is like, I'm done with it, y'all, <laughs> y'all leave. I don't need the drama right now. But Aquila and Priscilla, they end up leaving Rome at this time. Whatever the case was, we see them here and they become an encouragement to Christ. We don't know if they're believers yet at this point. The Scripture is silent. If they're not, they're very, very close because the next chapter over, you're going to see them discipling a man named Apollos. I think that they're probably saved at this point. But this is what happens. Paul also arrives at Corinth. He's been in Athens. He doesn't have any friends with him. He's by himself. He comes to Corinth and he doesn't have any money. So he begins to work with his hands. This is what he does. He goes looking for somebody who does his trade. You see that in verse 3. And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. It, these ancient cities, they had guilds. We could think of them similar to being something like a union. And many of these cities, we read historically, had a Jewish guild where the Jewish workers could go and you could come in and you could find work that way. Well, it's possible that Paul went to a guild or maybe some other way he meets Aquila and Priscilla. And they're tent makers like him, people who made tents or worked with leather. That was one of the things that they did. And so Paul joins himself to them, and then he actually lives with them. He stayed with them. You look at Paul here, and then it says in verse 4 that he would work with his hands during the week, and then he would go and reason in the in the synagogue on the Sabbath, verse 4, he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. So Paul is working with his hands and then 
proclaiming the gospel on the weekend. Now, I said this earlier, it's easy to look at Paul and think, hey, he's an apostle, we kind of elevate them to superhero status. They're not, but uh, they're still apostles. There's only 12 of them when it comes down to it. There are a lot more of us. I, I want you to look past Paul for just a moment and look at Aquila and Priscilla because anyone can be Aquila and Priscilla. Anyone can be a disciple who brings encouragement to those who live in proclaiming the Word and uh, be somebody who makes disciples themselves. You could describe Aquila and Priscilla this way. They were the dynamic duo. You see them. Every time they're mentioned in the Bible, they're mentioned together. Aquila and Priscilla. Luke and Paul end up flip-flopping their names sometimes. They're a, a team for the kingdom. Priscilla and Aquila. Aquila and Priscilla. She clearly plays a role in their ministry together. She is a prominent woman who is known in the early church. Priscilla isn't a timid woman hiding in the back of the house only to appear to cook a meal. She is a disciple-making partner with her husband. They're the dynamic duo. They were faithful and flexible. You see them everywhere. They're in Rome. They're in Corinth. They're in Ephesus. Then you see them back in Rome when Paul writes the letter to the Romans. He gets to chapter 16. This is... Years afterwards, you get to chapter 16, verse 3, and he's like, say hey to Aquila and Priscilla. And the church is in their house. And then he's in Ephesus, or they're in Ephesus. Hey, say hey to Aquila and Priscilla. They're over here. Say hey to Aquila and Priscilla. They're just everywhere. They are, they are flexible. You could put it this way. They lived lives that were on mission. They were also courageous. They stood with Paul. Paul says in Acts 16.3, say hey, I'm paraphrasing there, say hey to Aquila and Priscilla, they risked their necks for my life. I mean, they put their lives on the line for him at one point. They were hospitable. And just about every time you see them, their house is, is open for ministry. They're hosting a church there. They're, they're hosting Paul. The Corinthian church likely met in their house. The Ephesian church we know met in their house. The Roman church met in their house. What they had was for the Lord's use. And I'll tell you, if you're going to be a Christian that practices hospitality, and you should be one that practices hospitality, we're, we're told in Hebrews 12 to practice hospitality. If you're going to be a Christian that, that practices hospitality, this means you're going to have to have open hands. This isn't my property. This is for God's use. Uh, you're going to have to be somebody who's not overcommitted, who has every second of your life planned so that you, are, you, you have enough time to welcome people into your home. You're going to have to be somebody who doesn't want to isolate yourself. In other words, you can't be a Christian groundhog. Disappearing in your house, not seen again till Sunday. You've got to open yourself up to community within the church. You have to be somebody who doesn't love comfort. Being hospitable and, and, and your house being a place that's at, it's work. There's a balance for sure, but our schedule should be geared not to our comfort, but towards the kingdom. And then ultimately, if you're going to be hospitable, you're going to have to be not selfish. Not living life for yourself, but instead living an overflow of the gospel, giving in response to all that you've been given. Just about anybody can be hospitable. And don't think that that has to be in your house. That can be here every Sunday, spending time with people. It can be in the week, uh, getting coffee with them, calling them, just uh, making them feel welcome, bearing their burdens with them, giving of yourself for others. That uh, the open hands, not being overcommitted, isolating yourself, not loving comfort, and not being selfish. Uh, that list was from a, a pastor named Tony Marita. I found it helpful. They were also disciple makers. We'll see this in a few weeks, but when you get to chapter 19, they're going to meet Apollos, this man who has, has heard about Jesus, but he doesn't have a full picture of Jesus. And they're going to hear Apollos preaching and Apollos is going to be doing a great job, but he's not going to know about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. He just knows the teachings of Jesus. And they're going to pull him aside, both of them. And they're going to show him the way, and they're going to lead him to Christ, and they're going to disciple them. So when you see Aquila and Priscilla, other than Timothy, 
you hardly see anyone who is mentioned more by Paul. These were good friends who had his back, who I believe were an important source of encouragement for him as he came to Corinth. How else does the Lord encourage him? Well, the Lord meets our pressing needs. Look at verse 5. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that Christ, or that uh, Jesus was the Christ. So Silas and Timothy finally track Paul down. They finally arrive. This is more friends that have come here. But notice the switch. When they came, Paul was now occupied with the word. He is devoted to the word. What has happened here is Paul is no longer tent making. He's ministering the Word all the time. This means totally devoted to. What had, what had happened here? Well, you can look at Philippians chapter 4, and you can look later on in 1 Corinthians, and Paul, uh, 2 Corinthians, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 8, Paul is going to say, you know what? When I was in Corinth, there was this well-timed offering that came from the people at Philippi. The church at Philippi sent him an offering that freed him to do the work of the ministry and to focus exclusively on that. So tent making is good and necessary sometimes. When we're talking about tent making, we're talking about pastors doing work or working another job. It isn't glamorous. It isn't easy. It isn't really the best thing for the church when it comes down to it. It's good when the main leaders and, and preachers are able to devote themselves into the, to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. We see that in Acts 6. And it's good when they can be devoted to those things. Yeah, I'm grateful that the church has allowed me for years to be uh, kind of bivocational. I teach at a Christian school in town in the mornings, but even as our church has grown You've made it possible for me to cut back on that, to even focus more time here, to be more devoted to preparing sermons here and to the ministry of the Word here. That is a good thing. So we see as Paul, as soon as Paul could, he went back to living by the Word. That had to be a huge encouragement for him. You know, I can't tell you the number of times a well-timed gift, at least for our family, has been a shot in the arm. A tremendous encouragement. A believer coming alongside at the perfect time saying, hey, we want to help. We want to encourage you. Um, I've come into my office and found anonymous envelopes of different types. But I found anonymous envelopes that had uh, uh, some cash in it. And you will never know, those of you who did that, when that happened, So many times it was at the right time. Just a tremendous shot of encouragement for us when we needed it. We need to be people who are willing to receive when God sends those timely gifts. And we need to be people who are willing to give to any person in our fellowship to encourage them. He meets our pressing needs. That's what he's done for Paul here. The Lord also gives timely fruit. Verses 5 through 8, Paul is now able to devote himself to the synagogue. And so he goes in, he begins to proclaim Christ. He's testifying that Jesus is the Christ. Here's that flexibility again. He's with the pagans in Athens before this. And he's not talking about the Messiah. And now here he is again talking about Jesus being the Messiah. He knows his context here. And what does the scripture say? Verse 6, they opposed him and reviled him. Here we go again. Paul, though, in this instance, does something different. He gets up, he would have taken his robe or his coat, and he just kind of shakes it like that. This is an ancient way of saying, I'm done. I'm not doing... This happened in Ezekiel. It's a little bit similar to the Lord Jesus saying to knock the dust off your feet when you leave a town if they won't reject you. Paul shakes the garment. Uh, He's done. He says, your blood is on your own head. I'm innocent. I tried. I tried to help you, and you wouldn't listen. And this is a very vivid picture of him saying, I'm talking to the Gentiles from now on. I will go to the Gentiles. I will give them the gospel. Now, he's not writing the Jewish people off. You're going to see him leave um, leave Corinth. He's going to go to other cities, and guess where the first place he's going to go? It's going to be the synagogue. But in this particular situation, he's done. He isn't going to keep beating his head against the wall in that city. It's okay to move on sometimes. 
and find people who are more willing. And that's what Paul does. He moves on to where? Next door. <laughs> like literally, next door. Uh, look at verse 7. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. When, when it says next door, it means literally next door. The word means attached to. It might have been a, a series of buildings. And, and here it is right next to it. And so Paul ends up here. And, and uh, Titius was a God-fearer. He was one of the Greeks who might have been in the synagogue listening to Paul. And Paul leaves and Titius is like, Hey, why don't you, why don't you come to my house? Why don't you come to my house, and you can use that as a place to proclaim the gospel. Look who God saves in that. Verse 8, Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord. He entrusted himself to the Lord. Not just Crispus, but his entire household believed in the Lord as well. And because of their example, it seems that there were many others who ended up believing in the Lord. They weren't just, they didn't just believe. They were baptized. Publicly identifying with Christ, knowing that these people were opposing and reviling Paul and knowing that that was going to come to them as well. This is massive. I, I tried to think of a modern equivalent to this. It would be like if there was a mosque in Greenwood and the imam of the mosque ends up following Christ. Ends up becoming a believer. Can, can you imagine the consternation that that would cause in that situation, in, in that mosque? Can you imagine the joy it would cause on our part when the, when the leader ends up trusting Christ? See, what Jesus is doing here, He's raising a brightly lit city that's set on a hill in the middle of the darkness in Corinth. What a shot in the arm. Live a life devoted to Christ and watch God come through with timely encouragement when you need it most. God's not done yet. He's not finished. He gives timely fruit and He gives encouraging promises. We see this down in verse 9. Look at Paul here. All the good stuff that's going on. He's got new friends. He's able to focus on the Word. He's had this gift. He's got these people who've come to Christ. Your boy is still struggling. Why does the Lord come to him and say this if he isn't? Verse 9, And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Don't be afraid, but go on speaking. Don't be silent. I'm with you. No one will attack you to harm you, for I have many people, uh, for I have many in this city who are my people. What is it that Paul is battling here? Fear and intimidation. Don't be afraid. Don't be silent. Don't stop talking. Don't, don't let them intimidate you into silence. Think about what's happened. Paul has just been shaking the garment and the conversion of Crispus. I bet you he's expecting trouble. He's probably thinking, I've been here before. I know what's about to happen. It's happened everywhere else. Perhaps he's a little gun shy. Maybe he's being tempted to avoid conflict. Maybe, and I think that you see this here, he's worrying about stuff that hasn't happened yet. Do you ever do that? Worry about stuff that hasn't happened yet? Borrowing trouble? You ever been awake in the middle of the night thinking about a thing and come up with every single bad scenario? And not just come up with every bad scenario, but play every single one of those bad scenarios all the way to their horrible conclusion and then pick the worst one thinking that's probably what's going to happen to you? Am I the only one? Bad things don't happen, have to happen for you to face this. So good things are happening here in Corinth. 
And Paul is still concerned that this is going to happen. He's still struggling. I debated whether to share this with you. I went to a pastor friend and said, would this, would this be helpful? And uh, we talked about some different ways to talk about it and, and word it, but <clears throat> in the past, and even now sometimes, I've had thoughts about just wanting to give up ministry. Just want to quit. A lot of different reasons for that. There, are, and most of the, these times, there's never hasn't been problems. Good things have been happening, and I'm still feeling that way, battling constant fears, thinking it might be nice to work an eight to five job, not have to worry about the souls of an entire congregation, my inability and my weakness weighing heavy on me. Now, don't worry, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> I'm just telling you. I mean that's. It, it's more regular than you think. And it's probably regular sometimes in your life as well. It's going to be real for anyone who is seeking to live the life of a disciple. I mean, we've seen it in Scripture before. Think back to Elijah. Here, here Elijah is. He's just been on Mount Carmel. God has rained fire down from heaven, burned this water-soaked sacrifice up, just made a total fool of the prophets who were there and Jezebel and Ahab. Elijah flees. He finds himself next to a brook and he's like, God, I don't know if I want to live anymore. God comes to him with timely encouragement. He's going to do the same thing here. What do we do when we're in those situations? When I've had those thoughts, you know what the Lord has often done? He's brought me a good friend. He's brought me timely provision. He's brought timely fruit. But almost always, more than anything, He's pointed me to a promise. A specific promise from His Word. Now, the Lord gives Paul a specific promise here. And it's this. In this city, you're not going to be harmed. It doesn't say other cities, but right here, you're not going to be harmed. I'm going to take care of you. I've got your back here. He says... Paul, I've got more people in this city. There are more people that I've called to salvation. I know who they are. I've called them. Go find them. Stay here and complete the work. And you find Paul, other than Ephesus, here longer than any other place. I want you to know that this promise thing isn't just for Paul. Think of Hebrews 13.5. I will never leave you nor forsake you. The, the context of that is, hey, um, don't be covetous. Um, Christ is enough. I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And the principle applies to our lives. Whatever we face, Christ will never leave us. He is enough. We've got a promise like Romans 8, 28, that God works all things together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. It's something that we quote so often, but it's something that is real. All of this is possible because of the goodness of the Lord Jesus Christ to come and rescue us from our sins, to show us mercy, to save us, to bring us into His family, and then to promise to bring us ultimately safely into His presence when we either die or the Lord returns. All of this is possible because of that. We can be confident in these promises because we have a living Savior. We can be confident because we have a Savior who conquered death. We can be confident because we have a Savior who we see time and time again standing with His people in the middle of discouragement. God's heart to rescue us in trouble is seen in Him coming to rescue us in Christ. If He rescued us in Christ, will He not also rescue us in trouble? And that doesn't mean that we get out of the hard stuff always, but it means that He will be with us. You know, the unbeliever, somebody who's never trusted Christ, they don't have these assurances. You can't confidently say that God is for me because as Romans 5 says, you are the enemy of God. Your sin has separated you from God. The, the song that we sang, no, nothing that you can do can commend you to God. It doesn't matter 
uh, what you say. It doesn't matter whether you come to church. It doesn't matter whether you dress humbly. It doesn't matter whether you try to be a good person. None of that can cleanse your conscience. None of that can cleanse your hands. None of that can bring you to God. It is only putting your faith in the Lord Jesus that can bring you to God. And then when you put your faith in the Lord Jesus, you can be someone who will confidently believe that He will be with you through every season, through every mountain, and through every valley of life. If you've never trusted Christ, I urge you today to throw yourself on His His mercy and His goodness and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Save me. Forgive me. And if you will turn from doing it your way and trust Him and Him alone, and not your own works, His work on the, cro- on the cross for you and His resurrection, if you will trust Him, He will save you and He will save you today. You know, if you're a believer, when you're struggling, go to God's promises. Go, yes, to a Christian friend, who might pray for you and point you to those promises, but go find God's promises. Paul needed that. I need that. You need that. Now, the best thing in all of this is not just that God gives us encouraging promises, it's that He keeps those promises. And that's what verses 10 through 17 are about. At some point in the middle of Paul's stay in Corinth, all of the, the, the word Jews here has the idea of the religious leaders. These religious leaders, they get together, they have one mind here to do one thing. Shut Paul down. Now, Paul ends up staying in Corinth. After God gives him the promise, he stays in Corinth. Paul believes the promise. He obeys the command. We have to understand that many of these promises are conditioned on us exercising faith and walking obediently in God's will. Paul's here for a year and a half. And they try to shut him down. Now put yourself in Paul's place here. You read verse 12. But when Galileo was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal. So here he is again standing in front of these leaders. And these accusations are being thrown against him. He's having flashbacks of Lystra where he had been stoned. By the way, just a very brief side note, we see the accuracy of Scripture here, and particularly Luke's ability as a historian when he names this man and he uses the correct title, and then we find out that this is exactly at the time because there was an inscription with this man's name and title, July of A.D. 51, that was found in Corinth. So it allows us to date Paul being here in this time, but it also confirms the accuracy of what Luke wrote. He did his homework. What's the charge that they bring? Paul is breaking the law. He is encouraging people to worship God. Now, it seems like that would be something that they would want. Encouraging people to worship God. Now, they're not entirely being honest in this. The way they state it, they are trying to make Galileo think that Paul is violating Roman law. Roman law said that you couldn't introduce new deities. Couldn't introduce new gods. And so they're being sneaky here and they're trying to make it sound like Paul is breaking the Roman law at this point by creating some new religion, but God keeps His promise in here and He does this in two different ways. First way He keeps, he keeps His promise is that their deceit backfires. Paul is about to defend himself Look at verse um, 14. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Paul was about to say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. And Galileo starts to talk, and this is what he says. Look, if this was about breaking the law or some violent crime, I would care. Essentially, if Paul was stealing things and knocking people off, you would have my attention. But he's not. And then he calls him out. This isn't about that. You're trying to get me to settle your religious law. You're fighting over names, whether he's the Christ or not. This isn't about Roman law. This is about your religious law. I'm not going to have anything to do with this. Count me out. Get out of here. 
And this is big because it actually establishes a precedent that Christians were not transgressing Roman law. At least at this point, they changed their mind later on when they followed Christianity. From Galileo's standpoint, Christianity is kind of a sect of Judaism that is protected in the ancient world at that point. But notice this. This is, this is a final thought here. Notice how God worked. God worked providentially, not miraculously. You know, there were times that he threw prison doors open and brought an angel in to take him out. There were times that he sent earthquakes to open prison doors. Here, he just makes these leaders, the three stooges, in front of this, this proconsul. He just makes them look dumb. Some of you don't even know who the three stooges are, do you? You know, the possibilities of God helping His people is as infinite as His creativity. Sometimes it's opening the doors. Sometimes it's causing your enemies to defeat themselves. Sometimes it's Him walking through the fire with you. But you can count on this. Satan and all the powers of the world cannot move you if God wants you doing something. This allows Paul to stay for at least a year and a half. We think he might have been there longer, possibly two years. It allows him to stay, and we see a church that begins to rise out of this unimaginable paganism that becomes a flawed, <laughs> but growing church that is rightly related to its shepherd. A city that is set on a hill. And when Paul went in there versus when he left, you can see how he went in, you can see how he leaves when he goes to Ephesus. God was good to him. God gave him what he needed. He gave him the encouragement that he needed. He was with him every step of the way. So brothers and sisters, never doubt his love and care for you. Never doubt his inability to fail in keeping his promises. That means he cannot fail to keep those promises. This promise of no harm to Paul was for that situation. Later on, he moved on. He did see harm, but the Lord was with him here. And I would say the same thing about Sosthenes right here at the end. Now, we, we don't know exactly who this Sosthenes was. He was the ruler of the synagogue. Some people think that he succeeded Crispus, and he ended up becoming a believer himself. Because Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, says, Hey, I'm writing to you. I've got Sosthenes with me. And that they're beating him for that. It's also possible that he was one of the, the leader Jewish leaders and as they were driving him out, he happened to be beaten. Whatever it is, I tend to think that he, was, that he had become a believer and a follower of Christ. Whatever it is, God and His sovereignty spared Paul this time while Sosthenes took the beating. A time of peace for one believer might be a time of trial for you. And here's the thing, God is with you both. So, what do we walk away from this passage with? Number one, are you confident in the presence of Jesus with you because you've been saved? You've put your faith and trust in Him. You, you know that you're not the enemy of God. You know that you're the friend of that you're the son or daughter of God. Not because of anything you've done, but because of the work of Jesus on your behalf. You're trusting Him and Him alone. If you've not trusted Christ, I would love to take the Scripture and show you how that can be true of you today. Please see me afterwards. I want, I want to show you this good news, this free gift that God offers. And then the last thing that we take away from this, I would say this. If you are one of my discouraged brothers and sisters, come and rest in your Savior. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. Cast your cares on Him because He cares for you. Don't borrow troubles, but lay your worries on His omnipotent shoulders. Trust His heart for you. The heart that moved Him to die for you now moves Him to shelter you and encourage you as you live for His glory. And when you close your eyes to sleep at night, do so in confidence that He isn't sleeping and that He's in control of whatever it is that you're worrying about. Walk with Him. Watch Him bring the right people, the right provisions, the right promises at the right time. He will never fail you.
if you don't mind, heads bowed, eyes closed.